Yeah, and thanks for the reminder. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, James is doing it. Yeah, James is going to uh, introduce, introduce our speaker and, and say because everybody knows who James is. So <laughs> take it away, James. Thank you, Charlie. Yep, uh, this is the, I'm James Caulfield, the host of, with Charlie, of today's roundtable for the NMSU, sorry, for the uh, UUCLC, <laughs> you know, gee, gosh, um, <laughs> I'm tired. So yes, we have today with us Don Kurtz, yes. we're pleased to have, uh, he's going to, yes, Don Kurtz has been, are you, no, hey Mark? Mark, you need to mute. I, I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry. Okay. That's good. Don Kurtz has been active as a political and policy advisor for almost 20 years. Prior to that, he taught Spanish at New Mexico State University and wrote and published two novels and a guidebook to the Guadalupe Mountains National Park. He is one of the co-founders of the Progressive Voters Alliance, Progressive Voter Alliance, and was a member of the organizing committee for the recent Power Up Las Cruces Expo and Training at the Las Cruces Convention Center. His talk today is Electrify Everything, Four and a Half Personal Decisions That Will Save the Planet. Um, the rest of the description is a worldwide move toward electrifying transportation, buildings, and industry offers the best path to addressing a rapidly warming climate. This presentation will discuss that movement and what it means for each of us personally. Um, I guess one thing is we'll have questions at the end. And if you have a clarification question, you can put that in, but we'll try to keep those to a minimum. And I think that's it. Uh, Don, would you like to present? Sure, thank you. Thank you very much. And it, it's really great to be with you. Uh, Unitarian Universalist uh, Organization Church has a huge influence way beyond your membership. There's no doubt about that. And whenever in the years I've been involved in policy struggles and different things over the years, there's always you, you people there, uh, you know, playing an important role. I hope it's okay if I tell you the, the one and only Unitarian joke I know, which I probably you've all heard is, is that if Unitarians had a choice between going to heaven or going to a discussion about heaven, they'd go to the discussion, right? And so I'm kind of that way too, you know, so it's it's really, it's, it's fun to be here. So anyway, without further ado, uh, it, all of us know, uh, all of us are educated people. We read the newspaper. We keep up with uh, public dialogue. And the climate crisis is probably one of the greatest crises we as a species have ever faced. I think that's safe to say. Uh, and, you know, none of us need a recitation of all the problems that are coming our way if we don't deal with this very robustly and in a relatively short period of time. So, I think for, we've known this obviously for many years, but I think for a while, just like I, you know, if we've di been diagnosed where we got serious symptoms about something, it takes us a while to start getting our minds around what to do about it. And I think there was a hope that, well, if we drove a little less or if we um, planted enough trees or if we didn't fly to see our grandchildren uh, at Christmas, that would help. And or at least even more, more hopefully that it would fix the problem. Well, I think it's become clear to us over the last 10 years that we need to do a lot to solve this problem. And I think we spent another three or four years kind of floating around in despair. I'm not really sure what to do, especially to do personally, but also what to, what to do collectively. And I think the dialogue, is, from my standpoint, changed about three or four years ago. I've, I've been tracking this for a long time, been interested in it and involved in it to the extent I could be. But 
what happened was, uh, I think the person I think of as moving this dialogue along quickly was a man named Saul Griffith, like Andy Griffith, but Saul is his first name, S-A-U-L. And he came prominently out about two or three years ago, was being interviewed a lot on podcasts. And he, he wrote a book called Electrify, uh, an optimist guide for our clean energy future. And I'm gonna mention just, uh, there's, there was a podcast I heard that I would say was a real changing point for me. And that was, uh, if you Google Saul Griffith, a wartime plan, you'll find that podcast. And it's an hour, he's a funny guy. He's a, a MacArthur fellow, he's a MIT PhD and a founder of Rewiring America. And so with all that pro, pre, pro amble, I'll mention one other thing that he became quite close with Senator Heinrich and uh, also has had a huge influence on uh, President Biden's uh, Inflation Reduction Act and many, many other things. And so what he said is um, there's only essentially one way that we're going to have a shot at this, at turning this trajectory around in time and at scale to make a difference. And that's to electrify everything that we're currently burning fossil fuels for, okay? And so that's essentially transportation, buildings, and industry, which I'll go into a little more detail in a minute. But the key to that is that electricity has to be generated from increasingly carbon-free sources, right? And there was a period of time where that didn't look too likely and somehow uh, it's become likely uh, and, and, and in, a, in a big way. For example, thanks to the Energy Transition Act passed by the New Mexico legislature and signed by uh, Senator Lujan Grisham, I mean, Governor Lujan Grisham, uh, all investor-owned utilities, and most of the co-ops have to follow behind too, but all of them have to be 50% renewable energy, 50% of their electricity has to come from renewable sources by 2030. That's only seven years away, right? And 100% will be zero carbon by 2045, okay? So in many ways, uh, all we, which is cars, which is buildings, which is uh, industry, has to do to is plug into our local utility, and uh, they're on a really quick trajectory to get there. You know, I forgot earlier. I think, oh, if we can all get solar panels, which has been good, but there's a lot of houses to cover up with solar panels, and whether it would get us there compared to working with the utilities to do it is a question. But anyway, that's the basic. The basic formula. And uh, I think it's, um, it's hard to watch uh, a sports program on TV without seeing electric cars and electric trucks dominating the commercials. So EVs are, are on their way. For better or worse, that's, that's the way this, uh, our economy and our society are moving towards electrification of vehicles and not incidentally towards the electrification of heavy vehicles as well. Uh, the four, the 18 wheelers and everything will be coming. Now, that one uh, seems to be something that I've personally felt was, is, is moving along other than buying an EV. I, I'm not sure what I would do on it. Uh, so that one is moving. I per personally have been very involved in the electrification of housing, the housing sector, which I'll talk to you in, in, in about in a little while. And then there's industry. Uh, and, you know, uh, it's, it's phenomenal, the amount of money being invested by private, by government to some extent, but it's dwarfed by private investors on all three of those sectors. It's an amazing infusion of capital. And, uh, you know, two of the forces that probably I've, uh, tried to make sense of and contended with over time, the corporate power and mob monopoly utilities 
in some ways we're all headed the same direction now. And uh, we're, we've got to have massive investments. Um, that's what utilities were originally set up to do and massive quick investments to develop a sector. And so that's what's happening, you know? And I think people, given all our histories have mixed feelings about that, but that's what's happening on the broader sector. And I think uh, it's gonna be an, obviously an all or all of the above approach to climate, but this to me is the game changer. It's why I, why I personally am optimistic about it and what I think is gonna make a big difference. Now, the, the title of this was, what do we personally do? What can we personally do to, uh, to save the planet? And there's four and a half, which I'll, I'll enumerate. And it's all based on things that we can do at the logical point in our own family and economic lives for these things to happen. And this is part of, I think, the genius of Saul as he was advancing this. We're, we are not asking people to radically change our lives, not because radically changing our lives isn't a good idea. I mean, there's all kinds of things that we should be doing differently from not eating as much beef to plastic or whatever. But the key element here is we've got eight to 10 years to turn this around. And so what can we do? What can we do to be a part of this? So uh, it's often said that these are decisions we make around the kitchen table. So the, the first one is when we're ready to buy a new car, we buy an electric car. Okay. And I'm speaking as a person who drives a 2009 Civic, right? Gas, obviously gas engine and stuff. And I'm getting ready. I'm excited, but mainly it's my excitement of wanting to be part of the part of this that's driving me. Uh, somebody is going to be driving my car until it drops, whoever I sell it to or whatever. So that car is already committed there. But the question is, when each of us come to the point of buying another car, we buy an electric car or conceivably a plug-in hybrid, depending on, on what, we, what, what fits us. But so that's the first one. We just make the decision now, right? And uh, most of us have a little time before we're ready to pull the trigger on that. And we kind of start thinking, oh, what would I be interested in, et cetera. The second is uh, ideally a couple of years before your air conditioner is ready to go. So you look at it, I mean, air conditioners last, last left for lucky 13, 14, 15 years. If, it's, if yours is getting up there, like mine is, you start thinking, when it's time, I'm going to buy a heat pump instead of an air conditioner. And we can go into more detail of that, of course, but a heat pump, it's kind of an unsexy name, really. But a heat pump is basically an air conditioner that runs in reverse, right? I mean, you, and so during the summer, it's taking heat out of your house and depositing it outside. And doing, during the winter, it is taking heat out of the outside. And the, there are heat pumps now that'll do that down to 15 below zero and creating and heating your house inside. And I'm sure there's people who know more about physics than I do, but it's all about moving the air. And your heat pump is not like your gas furnace heating up anything. It's just, it's, it's just, moving heat from one side to another. And it does it the same way our refrigerators work. It does, does it by the, the compression or expansion of uh, the fluid that's in these very narrow pipes, right? That run through your house and then come to, a, to an air, hand, uh, to come to the out, I forget what you call it, um, that's in your room. And it, it uh, makes the conversion and puts out warm air. And so we wanna decide to do that. And to show the influence of um, Mr. Griffith and Senator Heinrich, who is a hero in this whole field, the Inflation Reduction Act is replete with rebates and, and tax incentives to do exactly that. To buy new cars, you know, the Chevy Bolt, the car I'm looking at, with the rebate, it's about $20,000 car, brand new car should last a long time. That's the record so far of the renewables on the road. So that's good. 
Heat pumps historically cost a little more than uh, air conditioner, but uh, for low income people, the, the government over the next 10 years will essentially buy your heat pump for you. Uh, but for middle income people, there's still a couple thousand dollars off on it, which makes the difference between an air conditioner and a heat pump. So you definitely wanna be thinking of that. Okay, that's the, that's the second one. So that's one and two. Your next car needs to be an EV. Your next um, air conditioner needs to be a heat pump. The third one is a heat pump water heater, right? Now, this is a little tricky on rehab, especially if it's in your closet, right? Uh, like in a lot of houses, right? That's, that's our case. And But um, for new construction, by the way, everything I'm naming here is completely a no-brainer. It's more economical to install originally, with the, especially with the rebates and not putting in gas in a new construction. And it's uh, more economical to run. It's much safer. It's much more comfortable, all of those things. And the market would undoubtedly move in that direction, just like it has in the Southeast of this country. I mean, in the United States, uh, the last figures I saw were in 2020, the census asks about building construction and what people are putting in. 40% of the homes were put, a little under 40% of the homes are putting in heat pumps already, right? So if you've lived in the south, Southeast part of the United States, that's what people put in. And um, colder climates, people depended on gas. Even here, where heat pumps have made sense for a long time, um, gas has been king. I mean, it's uh, gas rates are low and have been. Although, as we all know, who any of us who have gas, that's not the true anymore. There, that it's really become coming under pressure. But anyway, a heat pump water heater. Uh, that's basically a water heater with a heat pump, little heat pump sitting on top of it. And so, what it does is it heats up the water over time. And the advantage of a heat pump, especially the, the better ones, is when you think of your own house, uh, I've, I've heard people say it, it's never really comfortable, right? It's either, it's either too cold and this enormous squish of hot air comes in or it's too hot and this enormous, enormous squish of, uh, of cool air comes in. That's very costly electric wise. I mean, it's a four takes a 40 amp circuit and it's just, it's pouring in. Heat pumps don't do that. They, they don't heat, they just move air from one side to another. And the better ones, which of course you'll want to get are called variable VRF, variable something flow. But anyway, they're like your car on cruise control where you know, you're driving along the highway and you don't speed up to 75 to pass somebody and then stop to zero and wait to do your next thing. No, you're keeping a steady speed. That's what the modern, um, I th I've called, heard them call varying capacity, but they're, they're an inverter technology where they're always just moving at the temperature very slightly up and down, right? And a matter of fact, the temperature comes out of a heat pump, maybe 108 degrees, 110 degrees, something like that often. So you hold your hand up there and you're already at 98, so it doesn't feel that hot to you, but the heat pump uh, installers always encourage people, look at the thermometer in your room. Is that the temperature you wanted? Okay, if it's not, turn up the thermostat, but it's not gonna come out of your, uh, it's caught coming out, but it's always like this, which is great for efficiency. A heat pump water heater, again, in new construction, Almost everybody puts their water heaters these days in the garage. That's what, that's what the production builders are doing. No problem. It's got plenty of room. It's got plenty of air around it. And it actually cools down your garage a lot in the, in the summer. But retrofits can be done, but they're, they're going to be more difficult. But it's four times as efficient as a uh, regular electric water heater. It's, they're, they're really miraculous appliances. And uh, people I know that have them love them. Okay, and so you got your EVs, you got your heat pump, and I don't know my my hot water heater went out two or three years ago. This was not part of anybody's thinking at the time. I just went out and bought a high efficiency electric. Uh, but you want to? I mean, obviously we want to move to electric either way if we can. We want if even if you can't get a heat pump one, get a very high efficiency electric, 
and we're not burning fossil fuels, okay? Again, all we're running is a compressor and a fan, and the air, the air is, is moving. It's not being heated in by some kind of external factor other than the sun and things like that. Okay, so EVs, heat pumps, a heat pump water heater, or at the very least, an electric hot water heater. And then the last one, and actually this was my fourth one, but I've been thinking of demoting it to the half, and I advertise four and a half, just because this is the induction stove, which really, when you come right down to it, doesn't save a ton of electricity, especially over another electric stove. It does elimin eliminate fossil fuels burning inside your kitchen. I mean, who thought of that? Uh, the, as, as, as some of you have been following on the news, the asthma rate, if you grew up, is 13% higher likely to have asthma if you grew up in a home where gas was being burned. Uh, also, for people my age, uh, correlated, correlated with uh, increased rate of Alzheimer's. It's, it's, never, it's not a great idea to burn methane openly inside our houses. And in, this, in Las Cruces, which is like most cities, there isn't even a code that says you have to vent the darn thing. And so, I mean, at the very least, if you have a vent, you wanna turn it on. If you've got a gas stove at home that you love and you wanna run your gas stove or don't love and wanna run your gas stove, turn on that vent. And secondly, Got to make sure the vent goes outside, which an awful lot of them don't do. They just go back, kind of through a little grease trap, and right back in your in your face, right? So induction stoves are fantastic. Um, James will remember at the uh, at the expo, the Doniana Branch, uh, uh, Doniana Community College, culinary arts ran all day long uh, demonstrations of the induction stove, and these demonstrations are amazing. I mean, they'll It'll heat a pan of water in 30 seconds, right? And conversely, a, a gas stove, just turning on your gas stove and burning, uh, you know, uh, heating up a saucepan of wire, water raises the indoor temperature of hazardous gases to higher than the EPA approves outside your house. So it's kind of a health thing too. It, it will, I mean, it's not the, the game changer on climate, but it's the direction to go. So the question is, how often do people replace their stoves? Well, not very often, although uh, there was a Stanford study just a year ago that huge percentage of electric sto of gas stoves are leaking all the time, whether they're turned on or not. And you might ask yourself, when's the last time you crawled under your stove and tightened up the con connections? I mean, never for most of us. And so Induction stoves, um, again, good, but they're not the climate changer simply because they don't, we don't use that much gas. But once you're getting rid of all your other gas, uh, you add in the induction stove, and all of a sudden you're not paying, what, 12 or 15 a dollar say, uh, a month for your gas fixed charges, right? And so that's, that's nice. So those are four. And then my half, which I'm thinking about promoting up to a better one is solar. And that is just putting in solar on your house. And that's because it's different than what Saul Griffith was talking about, the easy decisions. Just when we come to the end of a life cycle, at that time, that's when we pull the trigger. We don't have to change our lives in major ways. On the other hand, if on solar, you know, if you got some money in the bank, it's sitting in CDs or something or whatever, you know, a lot of us inherit a little money or whatever, um, putting in solar is great. I put it in 10 years ago, you have virtually no electric bill. Um, you get 40% back from the government, 30% from federal just got renewed and a 10% from the state just got renewed. And so what the heck, right? And so you wanna absolutely in that case, um, go to a reputable solar installer. And a lot of people come to our doors and knock on them, which I was always very excited about. Oh, it's happening, you know, but Unfortunately, a lot of them represent finance companies, not installers. And so what they're selling is the financing package and they just contract with somebody and leave town, right? And they're supposed to put in the installation and things. And uh, I'm not under any restrictions here. I'll tell you who I would talk to if you're interested in solar and that's um, Oregon Mountain Solar and Electric uh, is the name of the company. You guys got it? Yeah, I think Jenny has it too. Uh, yeah. I do too. These people, this comes out of positive energy. 
which was a completely super ethical company. And uh, Oregon Mountain Solar and Electric is no different. Uh, over the years, I've worked closely with the mayor. The mayor, invite, at my urging, invited um, Corey to come in from Oregon Mountain. And they told him, he said, no, don't do it. And, and the reason why is because commercial, and I think this is one of the things that's affecting uh, the, the conversation we had earlier about, is, is the rate structure is not beneficial right now for com commercial to um, go to solar and houses it doesn't affect. So uh, there's really, it's, it's win, 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 win. So if you can do solar, why not? You know, and one of the things that, Saul Griffith talks about uh, as part of his formula is absolutely solar, but he's from Australia. In Australia, I think a, her, a third of the homes now have solar. And it's just because it's so advantageous. It's just as easy as buying a refrigerator. They come out, and no inspections, the, the solar people come out and put it in. Here, it's a little bit of a travail, right, to get it done. But uh, a good solar contractor can move you through it. And, and in no time, you're paying very, you're covering most of your daytime use with solar and you're selling stuff back to El Paso Electric and it's, it's great. So those are the, we can call them four and a half or four or five or whatever, but those are the things that we personally can do. And I, I think, you know, we should uh, go ahead and go visit the grandkids, fly out there and do it. It's not, it's not gonna change the overall formula. What's gonna change is that Everybody moves these basic appliances uh, through there, uh, and to the to they're no longer burning fossil fuels, and that's that's the formula. Uh, again, uh, our electricity is being increasingly uh, provided by uh, zero carbon sources, and I had the opportunity just two weeks ago to go out and see El Paso Electric's brand new Buena Vista facility. And it's a something to see 500,000. You couldn't even see them all. I couldn't see the end of them out there uh, being generating electricity uh, for us. And, you know, I have to say, uh, I fought 40 years ago. I was part of a group fighting uh, the, built the investment in Palo Verde nuclear plant. But now that it's there, it's a great thing to have because 24 7 is pounding out zero carbon energy, you know. And the problems that it had with disposal and mining, it already had before it ever came around. So for the lifetime of that, it gives El Paso Electric a little cushion to get over this. Matter of fact, if you go, I said we'd be 50% with El Paso Electric by 2030. Um, if you throw in, if you throw in what, El pa what Palo Verde is always doing, already doing, a lot of the day we're up around 60, 70% zero carbon energy, 50, well, when Buena Vista is fully, really fully on, but we're already at 50 and going up quickly as these new solar facilities come on. So anyway, that's basically the context. And as everybody knows, the devil's in the details and there are many, um, many nuances that I'd be glad to discuss based on questions and stuff, but, um, and a lot of things I don't know, but I spent, the, this is what I've been doing for the last two years. I will say one other thing. I mentioned my interest was in, uh, in new construction because it's easy to do then. Retrofits are hard, but it's easy to do on new construction. And <clears throat> part of our task is to catch committed emissions before they happen. So if we put in a new school or we put in a house, you know, that furnace is going to be burning gas for an awful long time, right? And then when you go to retrofit it, probably by statute in 15 or 20 years, it's going to cost a lot of money. So I've dedicated a lot of time to that with a couple of colleagues. And Metro Verde, many of you may be aware of Metro Verde, that's the, the huge development in north of Highway 70. And uh, Rene uh, Frank, who many of you may know, is uh, was with the Green Chamber a long time, a realtor in town, great, great person and realtor. We started going around and visiting developers and, and saying to them, why don't you just think about not putting gas into your new development? Just don't do it, right? You got to put electricity in, but don't put in gas. And 
um, John Moscato is the lead on that development out there. He said, well, you know, people really like their gas stoves and that's what people want and blah, blah, blah. And so we said, yeah, we talked for a while and he, he expressed his own concerns about climate, which, you know, kind of is way back there as we're talking. But anyway, we were surprised a week later, he called us and said, hey, guess what? I just turned in 25 new, 100 new home sites north of uh, Highway 70 there zero gas, all electric, we're not putting any in. And what's great about that is because then the developers who want those lots, and you know, there's not a lot of lots in that quantity for sale, they gotta do it, they gotta do it. And they gotta figure it out, which uh, was part of the reason we had the expo was kind of bringing all the sectors together so these guys could figure out how to do it. And, and you know, the, Nobody wants to change, myself included. You know, a new operating system, but but they they've got to, and um, so we're trying to do the same with institutions like New Mexico State, Las Vegas Public Schools. There's no reason in the world their new buildings would be anything but electric. And what John said to us was, he just put pencil to paper, and he said you put in the cost of the infrastructure itself, putting in gas, which he's got to do as the developer. For his 2,500 homes, that's $1,500 uh, a home. And you can calculate how many millions he's going to save on those 2,500 homes, but also just the cost of, of finance. And he said that to us that a new home with gas infrastructure slows down that home up to three months, just getting it out onto the market. And, 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 and I've learned a lot about development in the last two years. That's a heck of a lot of money financing whatever all your financing for three more months it's you know tens of thousands of dollars so uh and and so anything anyway i just wanted to mention new construction on that but i could as you can see could talk about this forever but why don't we um have some any questions and and what about this questions uh i'd be glad to answer oh uh, so i think uh, i agreed to call on people I think Jane just had a question. Uh, why don't you just ask that one, Jane? Okay, so uh, Don, I heard you say, you know, that uh, one of the places that, that work had been done was to uh, try to uh, talk with the Las Cruces Public Schools, if I understood properly, about new construction, making it carbon free. And so why isn't the new Columbia Elementary School going to be a carbon free school? Well, it may still be, uh, but what, what happened is, I mean, and I've had to come to grips with this, is just some projects we, we just didn't know yet and we weren't advocating quickly enough to get to them before they'd done a huge part of the design. So thanks to school board member Bob Wofford and school board member Pamela Horton, uh, yes. they've raised the issue with the, um, with the school the school staff and they're asking, they're pushing the staff to ask the architect to see what it would cost to retrofit for, um, not to retrofit, retrofit the designs, redesign for uh, all, um, all electric. And last week we met with the Mitsubishi representative who they're doing schools all over the country. And, you know, just talked, uh, they, he talked shop with the, the staff there so I don't know. I mean, I don't know if we're going to catch them in time. And the public is very impatient to get that school built, you know, because it's taken a long time. So I don't know if Bob and, and Pamela will prevail, but maybe, maybe. Great. So that's, the that's good to hear. That's yeah. encouraging in and of itself. Yeah. Mark, was that a question you wanted to ask? Yeah, uh, and actually, I have quite a few questions. Uh, the uh, uh, an awful lot of folks don't seem to know the difference between an electric stove and a convection electric stove, and there's a big difference in in um, in how um, efficient it is and how um, responsive it is. Do you know right. about that? Yes, I mean, um, what I I mean. The induction stove, first induction. off, I mean, I, I, I'm sure you know a lot about them. They just, 
they're just miracle things. It looks like this little round flat thing. And it, the way it works is it excites the uh, right. electrons inside the iron uh, pot or whatever, which means that, yeah, you, the aluminum stuff you have and stuff, unless it has enough iron, it's not going to work. But that thing, the, the thing underneath it never gets hot, right? And so it gets hot from the pot sitting on it. But other than that, you take the pot off, leave it for a second, you can just touch it, right? It's it's not hot. And so it doesn't burn people, can't catch on fire, et cetera. Now, so there's there's a regular electric coil stove. There's the kind of kind of electric coil that's in glass. That's what we got. It looks like, uh, it looks like, you know, looks nicer. It's easier to clean up and stuff. Then there's convection, which has to do with the oven and things. And then there's induction, which is a separate animal. But you're right, people just don't know about them, but they're reasonably priced in new construction. I think even the even the builders that aren't that enthused about going all electric, I think they're gonna upsell to a induction stove with the rebase. It'd be nice to be, be able to get the word out to people. Yeah. Somehow, so they know. know the difference and know how easy it is to convert over just buying the, the top. Well, yeah, you can buy it. What looks like a heat pad of, of as many burners as you want, just lay, put it on your counter, right? And plug it in. And so, yes, it, you're right. It's very easy. And I, my, uh, my wife, to a benefit of our whole family, watches a lot of the cooking shows and they're starting to cook more and more on induction. You'll see people doing it. And so something is gonna happen, Mark, I think that's gonna trip us and we're gonna get moving. I'd also like to mention that uh, 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 I forgot his name. I, I understand that um, Oregon Mountain Solar, they're like months backed up on getting them installed. They are. They are. And, and uh, also getting an EV right now. They're way, they don't, uh, I've got mine at, um, at the Kia dealership, and they don't even have them in yet because they're having trouble getting the the one part that we uh, you can't get them right now. But I understand. I I got an EV last year, and fortunately, but um, uh, the newer ones have better batteries than than mine. They're improving fast. And yeah, that's, you're uh, right. Yeah, I mean, there, it's just like computers were. You know, every year you can wait, you're getting that much better of a product because it's it's changing. But at a certain point, they're pretty good now. I mean, yeah, um, I'm happy. What what you get? What what kind of car do you have? A uh, uh, Kia. Oh, help me, Kathy. A Nero, I believe. Yes, a Nero. Thank you. Okay, and, and uh, you've been happy with it. Right? I love it. Yeah, I. But. Uh, Petri doesn't have any in right now. And um, if you bought one this year's, when they come in, they're better because they got better, they've got better batteries. Um, Mark, is it okay if we move on? We've got a bunch of people asking questions. Okay, okay. Anyway, I'll, great, to, great to talk to you about EVs on that though. I'm, get, I'm getting pumped up. Making big purchases are hard for me, but I'm gonna get my bolt, I think here. And I have, it's a three month wait for them too, yep. Yeah, wanted to mention, by the way, there's a study was that was done in New York City where they took a whole apartment building, replaced all the gas stoves with induction stoves, waited a year, and then said to the people, okay, do you want your gas stoves back? Zero. Nobody wanted the gas stove back. So induction stoves seem to be a real big hit. I think Dave Rice is next. You're muted, Dave. Okay, thank you, uh, James. Uh, just a quick question around the question at hand. If induction heating is so good for cooking, why hasn't the same technology been placed in hot water heaters? That's a great question. That's a great question. I don't know. I mean, heat pump, heat pump water he heaters, I guess they still got, so, so I'm trying to think how an induction would work. You'd have to stimulate Something magnetic. Yeah, yeah, you'd yeah. Have, right? yeah, yeah. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I don't know. Okay. Uh, my my the reason for I put my hand up, which I'll take down now, uh, was uh, you have you didn't speak at all about like improving the efficiency of existing buildings or anything uh, as a, as a contributor in this. Is is 
is is that because you're assumed it's going to happen anyway because of cost? No, I mean that's a really good point. I think the reason is is because I've been kind of really focused in on on new housing. So there, by definition, the the state adopted the 2018 International uh, Energy Code, something code, uh, and Energy Efficiency Code, IEEC, and it's a pretty darn good envelope now. So it's fully ready to hold in whatever we do on, on electric, but there are 20 or 30,000 homes out there, especially among low income people who, you know, leak energy like a sieve. And it's, it's gonna be a real challenge. And I think that's why the energy, uh, the, the Inflation Reduction Act incentivizes things so much for low income people because they're going to need, and I, I think ultimately there's going to be a need to be an infusion of cash at the policy level to help people get their houses uh, trimmed up in that way. But, uh, but yeah, that's that. Uh, you need a good envelope. That makes it a lot better, uh, for sure. And okay. we've been able to do well with bad envelopes because gas has been so cheap. But it's not going to be for long. It's not already not cheap anymore. Yeah. Okay, so is an, in that regard, is an energy audit a good idea, uh, for example, just in your experience? Yeah, I think it's a great idea, and it's now incentivized in the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, it will be by the end of the year. You get so much money for doing that. I think El Paso Electric has a bunch of rebates for that kind of thing as well. So that's a good idea. I want to mention on the Inflation Reduction Act, some of the, some of the rebates, for example, on vehicles, already now, because you take it off your income tax, the IRS just does it. And that's true for some of the, um, some of the rebates for builders. They're not huge for builders and new construction, but there's some there. But everything else is going through all 50 different states to be written up into rulemaking for that particular state based on the national. So that's supposed to be done by the end of 2023, but it's still, uh, I don't know. We, nobody knows exactly what that's going to look like and how it's going to work exactly. But that'll determine the exact parameters of how you get your rebates and tax incentives. Does that apply for an organization like a church or is it only for residential? You know, there is one. There, is, there, there are things there for the church. And I want to mention somebody at the beginning before we started was talking about the solar that I think you guys have some solar panels on the UU. Is yes. that right? And you're not seeing the reductions you'd expected in the electric bill. The reason for that is probably that El Paso Electric, once, once you go over a certain threshold, which is like 15 kilowatts, I think, then it puts you into a new rate class. And all you have to do is go over it once in a 30-day in a period. And for the next year, you're in the higher rate class. And this is something... And, and it's really unfortunate in our service district because in, in, in Albuquerque, it's 50 kilowatts. So you can have a lot bigger, you can do a lot more and you don't trip it as often, et cetera. So I think that might be the, what's going on. We've been in discussions with El Paso Electric where we think they may not keep it at 15. They may at least move it up to 50 and whatever. But anyway, let's see. So I guess I just, what was the original question again? I'm sorry. I was mainly seeking the idea about energy audits, and you, oh, you responded yeah. to that. Thank you. Yeah, and they're really they're really good to do. Uh, so absolutely, that that can help you. Yep. Thank you. Let's see. I know Charlie wants to talk to that, and I know Carla and I think Pat or Don are in are in line. I'm going to make one other comment. The buildings. I agree with uh, Don Kurtz. We lived in one of the buildings with no insulation, just cinder block. And I know a bunch of you do too. I do know that up in Santa Fe, someone switched from gas to the heat pump and their electric bills, their bills were 10 times as high. They don't have the insulation they need. I did write an email to the Dean of Engineering at NMSU and to Chipper Moore at DACC asking about those questions and whether they could give, because group, people in our group have been asking, well, will that work in my house? And my answer has been, I don't think so. I think we need some, some good information on it. Um, 
Charlie by Welch has worked on that question of the uh, energy. I think, is it okay if I will have you wait a minute, Charlie, and go to Carla and Pat first? Don first? Yeah. Uh, Carla, why don't you? I would love to get an electric car, but I'm concerned about the lack of charging uh, stations nationwide, particularly on the highways. Do you know what the federal plan is? Uh, maybe with the Inflation Reduction Act or otherwise about increasing the amount of charging stations? Yeah, I mean, they have, I think there's $7.6 billion in the IRA to and do that. The El Paso Electric's working on it. The state's working on it. Everybody's working on it. Um, yeah, I just, you know, for so many reasons, we're... There's there's snags at each level simply because it's so new and there needs time to kind of get out and stuff. I think it's easier for a Tesla now because they have such a widespread charging system. And I read that they are going to open up their chargers to uh, everybody over the next oh. year. Partly because uh, they, they can't get government subsidies for expansion that everybody else is getting if they don't do that. But I've, I've heard that. So it is still a problem. I think a Tesla can still get you up to Albuquerque with no problem. Uh, my Bolt meant to stop somewhere and there, you know, and it, it's hard, but you know, it, it is a difficult thing still, but right. one year from now, it's going to be twice as good. And two years from now, four times as good. It's going to happen. There's so much investment going there and everybody's going to have a car. They're going to want to go somewhere. And mm -hmm. so I think that's, that's happening. And, and for, by the way, I just want to mention something I learned on this is um, much of our much of our charging is going to happen at home, right? And so we get home at night, we plug it in and go. And that El Paso Electric has good rebates on that, and it's a relatively easy hookup. And so for the cars that are around town, I, I guess that's kind of our strategy. I'm going to get the electric car. My wife's going to keep her gas car and, and we'll use mine around town and hers when we travel. The plug-in mm -hmm. hybrids are great for that in that sense mm -hmm. because you can get 25 miles around town and then go on gas. It just switches over to gas when you run out of juice, you know, so mm -hmm. it's going to be tough for a while. I think, it's, and that's true, we'll probably come to it, but that's true with heat pumps on retrofitting and stuff. All of those have snags just because people aren't, the installers aren't ready that the chargers aren't there yet. It's just one of those things. But a year from now, I'm confident it'll be much different and on down the line. Hi, oh, thank you. Yeah. I think it's Don next. Yeah, okay, Don here. Hey, Don. Um, <laughs> we've been uh, talking a lot of our discussion has centered on efficiencies. And that of course is good. Um, I want to look at a bigger picture in terms of the total demand for energy in any country and how that squares with the amount of real estate you need to have renewable energy supply your energy. You know, right now, solar and wind are giving us, I don't know the exact numbers, maybe you know, about 10%, perhaps at the most, of uh, the energy we use. And if you want to switch to uh, all of those sources. Uh, so that's a factor of 10 in real estate that you've got to figure out where you're going to put it. And then you look back at the 20th century when demand for energy increased a factor of 10. And we have to be prepared for that to happen again. So now you're talking some huge expanse of area. And there are places where the sun doesn't shine and places where the wind doesn't blow and you need to reserve spaces for residences and industry and highways. And then there's a big factor about ecological disruption. You just can't cover the whole country with solar panels and expect not to destroy the environment. So in the long run, I think we have some pretty big problems here that um, I just don't think they've been looking far enough ahead. And yeah, it's nice to charge your electric car overnight, except, uh, well, the sun doesn't shine at night. And well, there's a lot of problems out there. And if you have any 
perspective on this matter. Uh, I'd like to hear it. Yeah, I, I mean, the, the first place I, I can agree 100% is there's a lot of challenges out there to make, make this all happen. That's absolutely true. Um, I will say, I, I talked to you about when I saw Buena Vista's 500,000 solar panels, um, it was impressive, really impressive, but I can't remember whether it only takes up a thousand acres or it only takes up a hundred acres, but in the vastness of that huge swath of land, and a friend of mine just flew over it the other day coming into the airport, I mean, it's just a little pinprick. I personally feel that we got lots of land. Now, I think there's gonna be some battles over, um, uh, over the environmental part uh, and I think we're, you know, we're gonna have to prioritize some of those things. They'll be hard fought, but I think it's, it's a lot like the mobilization for World War II. If we're saving, saving uh, society as we know it, I think there'll be some sacrifices made, uh, uh, just like we took over those ranches out of White Sands and stuff. But that having been said, I don't think that's gonna have to happen. And I, and I was part of the El Paso Electric Integrated Resource Plan um, planning where they switched from building a new gas plant every three years, just like clockwork, costing us as great payers, a billion dollars over the life of that plant. Um, now to all renewables, I think they're, they claim to be confident they can make it. And that we're, that's assuming that batteries come along and, and other things. Uh, but, oh, the other thing that's going to happen too is you mentioned the, um, the nighttime charging. Yeah, yeah, you're right about that. I think EV people are going to start getting cheaper rates over the next five, eight years for doing it during daytime when we got 10, plenty of renewables going. I think that's true. But right now there's a surplus at night simply because people don't have all their stuff turned on and things. So I think we're going to see the electric company constantly revising how they approach this. They, both El Paso Electric and PNM do not anticipate a problem meeting the EVs requirement. And frankly, I don't think they, they take our efforts in the building arena seriously enough to worry about us yet. So they don't, they don't even calculate it, uh, but um, we'll fix that. But anyway, I think, I think we're gonna I think we're going to be okay on land and stuff. The difficulty is still balancing it throughout the day, as you indicated. And, you know, we're all really rooting for batteries uh, to come along and, and, and they're planning on them. They're getting better all the time. So we'll see. But I think what we're kind of doing is plunging ahead and waiting for some of those solutions to show up as they come, because we don't have time to wait for the solutions. Again, back behind all of this, is we have got to do this. And, you know, it's, it's just like, we're kind of in this mass um, effort. And I know none of the people here, we think about it, but it's, it's almost hard to imagine the extent of impact that this changing climate is gonna have on us as a society. I was just down in Florida visiting our grandkids and all along the beach there when Hurricane Ian came in, the seawater is high enough that it all washed out. When it washed back, it washed all the sand under the swimming pools and everything out in front of those resorts and they just crumbled, you know, and that's just in the last few years. So that's gonna be bad. Climate migration's gonna be bad. Everybody's, you know, and so I, I think we've got a, um, I, I think the answer is yes, there are gonna be risks. And I think you did a good, idea, good job identifying them. We've got, got no choice. We've got to move forward on this. So far, so good. I think it's looking pretty good. So that's that's my, my strategy. I, I'm not sure everybody shares that. But. Yes, well, I, I would add that, again, we have to stop thinking about being able to supply our energy at the demand that we have now and start thinking about what it's going to be a century from now. Otherwise, you're going to get roped into another problem that we already have with fossil fuels. I do, I do think fossil fuels will linger around, especially at peak hours. I think we're still going to, but, but there's a lot of hope, even on El Paso Electric, uh, that hydrogen for running plants, uh, where I think hydrogen running cars is a pipe dream, or running houses is a high pipe dream, but 
there's a possibility it can be done at the utility scale to run those peaker plants at peak. I think that's one source. And the other is a heat pump is, is much more efficient than, uh, than a regular electric heat or something. So I think they're gonna to try to gain some of those efficiencies. And with El Paso Electric, it's not really the amount of their generating capacity that's the question. It's the generating capacity at peak. That's what you worry about. So the rest of the time, it's like the school bus is going to school. There's a time when all the school buses go and then the rest of the time they're sitting around the garage. That's gonna be the case for a lot of electricity for El Paso Electric. And I think the utilities in fact are going to way over generate because uh, renewables are so inexpensive. It's just they're at inconvenient times right now. But um, I think I don't think they're worried about getting enough, enough electricity except at peak. And the other thing is a hundred years out, yes, I mean, who knows, but they do plan 25 years out. And I think they're still thinking they're good 25 years out on this. And Let's see, I'm gonna call on Charlie. We have about five people waiting in line. Uh, Don, I will mention that Harper's Magazine, the January edition had an article by the name of Boomtown about the solar land rush. And one of their points in that was where the plants go in is dependent upon where the main uh, power lines are. Yeah. And nobody's really laying that out yet. And so the whole, and one of the other things is if you put it in the right place, you can have it on the highway medians. You can have it all kinds of places where it wouldn't bother anybody or it would shade buildings, places that would be fine. Uh, so that's a great topic to bring up. Charlie, yeah, those are good, good solutions, absolutely. Charlie, you've been waiting all this time. Uh, no problem. I just wanted to answer a question that was in a logical question that was brought up. Why not use induction for water heating? Well, the reason for induction is not efficiency because induction merely con uh, converts the electric energy into heat for the water. And that's what you don't want to do to heat a home because it takes so much of it. Well, the water heater takes a lot of heat. So you're, you're in the same boat if you try to use induction for water heating as if you use resistance for water heating. On the other hand, the induction to replace gas makes a lot of sense for cooking. For one thing, it means you don't have to run the gas line to the house. And for another thing, it means you don't have the pollution inside the house from burning the gas because the induction does not produce any of that. And cooking does not take much energy, believe it or not. Right. So go ahead with uh, the rest of it. No, I appreciate all of that. Thank you for the, the background on that, yeah. Uh, Steve and Susan. I think somebody's on mute. Hi, um, I, yeah, I enjoyed your, we have a problem with our hot water heater. Our garage is so hot, it's, it's uncomfortable to go in there. And uh, I, I think it's because our, our uh, door is dark and it attracts all the, the uh, sunlight. We have a southern exposure. But I did look up uh, at Lowe's uh, what an induction 50 gallon uh, tank would cost. And it's just a, a tad under $2,000. Whereas if I turn the page and look at one for gas or electric, it's about 500. Am I really going to save that much money? If so, I'll I, buy it right now. I, the answer, I think, is yes. I mean, uh, for this, there's two pieces of good news. One is, I think, the answer is yes. The very one of the first presentations I ever saw on on heat pump water heaters from Ream was claim, claiming claiming that the payback would be just a matter of months. Okay, it saves a lot. But the other is that the Inflation Reduction Act. It doesn't matter what your income is you can get back $2,000 a year for a whole, any one or bunch of uh, up to $2,000 of things like heat pumps or, or heat pump water heaters or whatever. So by the end of the year, you should have, um, oh, plus El Paso Electric 
has one right away for 300, right off the bat, you show them the receipt and they'll give you $300. And the inflation reduction by the end of the year, I think you can pay 30% of it up to $2,000. So it starts chipping away at it. And the other thing is it'll make your, much of your problem go away of a hot garage because it's gonna be taking that heat and heating the, the water in the tank. And, they, and people have told me it lowers the temperature five or six degrees just to have one running in there. Yeah. So, which is bad if you're, if it's in the house, it makes that room cold, right? Some people complain about, but anyway, out in the garage, it's a perfect place for it. We'll, we'll order one within the hour. <laughs> yeah, and that I think, you know, the, the ones I hear of, the Ream has been very helpful to us here. They were a sponsor at the expo and, and good. And uh, A.O. Smith, I think is the other major one, but they're around uh, and, and yeah, I, I'd be glad to, Anyway, Ream is, is, is good to, to work with any either of those, but I, I think they're good. They're good, and they'll do those things. Yep. A Google search says that it does pay back. Um, one estimate is seven years. Uh, I think the point that, was, that Don made, don't put it in your house, uh, because then in the summer, for instance, well, in the summer, I guess it's okay, but in the winter, it's pouring out. I don't know. You'll get you, you don't, it'll, it can produce counter to what you're trying to do in your house at that time. Yeah, in the basement, it's okay, or someplace like that. You, do, you need some air around it for it to convert. So even if you're in a closet, you need a hole in the closet, not a hole, but, you know, louvered thing so it can get air. But retrofits are always a challenge, but not necessarily if you got, yours is in your garage already out there. Perfect. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Back to and, you. Yeah. Mark, did you have a question? I want to mention one other thing. We didn't talk about um, we didn't talk about swamp coolers, and um, we didn't talk about the de the rapidly developing fusion, and also uh, uh, one one fellow was talking about having enough land for um, solar. Uh, when you put it on top of the house, not only are you cooling the house, but the the electricity you use doesn't have to travel a distance because every time electricity travels a distance on power lines, you lose a lot. Um, if, if it stays local, you don't need as much. And uh, that's a real, that's one of the real advantages of putting solar on your house. And um, yeah, I think the batteries are improving, hoping their batteries are improving rapidly so that, you know, you don't have to, be, be nice with the batteries to the point where I don't have to depend on EPE. And um, James, you were talking about one time about uh, them putting a lock on it so that you, you had to work through EPE and you couldn't make local. Um, uh, I can't think of what you call it. I, that's enough questions. I, 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 I'd have a million if you let me keep going. I'm putting my hand down. Uh, yeah, I know it. I think... Don has kind of said he's not going to answer questions about legislation. Is that correct, Don? No, I'm, I don't care. I'll answer any, anything. I, I, I don't, I, I'm happy to do that, James. I did want to mention the people who were just talking with me about the heat pump. We're at the point in the industry right now where you want to get some estimates from people because the pricing is all over the place and installers are new to it and they may overcharge you $1,500 and you never know, you know, so you want to get estimates. And the other thing, I mean, always from James, you can get my uh, email. Um, the people I work with and I are very interested in getting this supply chain out through the installers worked out so that people aren't being overcharged and stuff. So we'd be glad to help you uh, find uh, the right person to do that if, if that's the situation, yeah. I had one more question for you at least. Well, actually about seven, but you know, I was looking through that rewiring America materials and they give a whole bunch of examples of people who are re, you know, taking advantage of the Inflation Reduction Act to refit their houses. And what I realized is every one of those examples, the median income is far higher than Las Cruces. So the result is in Las Cruces, 
to get to be the uh, eighty percent of median income. So median income is forty five thousand one forty. That means to get the qualification of a hundred percent payment for your uh, hot for your heat pump, you have to be down to thirty six thousand dollars income, which is pretty low. And in fact, the cutoff is at 150% of the median income, which is $67,000 in Las Cruces. So that means everybody above $67,000 is considered high income. Sorry, you don't qualify for the Inflation Reduction Act. And I looked at those numbers and I guess my feeling was, wow, we're being punished because we're poor. Uh, because I'm looking at, you know, these people in Sandusky, Ohio, and, you know, all over the country. Great. Well, they get, you know, they, they're they earning $180,000, and they're in the median, they're below the median, so they get a full uh, rebate on these things. And I'm thinking, gosh, those people have lots of money. And here in Las Cruces, if you earn 70, you're out of the running. So, yeah, you know, <clears throat> James, you were kind enough to send me some of those thoughts ahead of time. And I, I have to say, they, they threw me for a loop. I was trying to think, okay, what, what, what's going on here? And so I, there's a, I, I think your point is still really good. Uh, it's just there's a couple of things I thought that come out of that. What it does mean, so if you make, to get half of the costs paid for that you, you know, instead of 100%, uh, 67,000 is is the cutoff, right? As you say here, and it's much higher where people are making higher incomes. That does seem unfair to me. On the other hand, um, the good news is we got a ton of very poor people in Las Cruces and they're gonna get essentially brand new HVAC and everything in their house for essentially zero if they get with the program and stuff, which is the challenging part there. So there's some good news in our own community, but we're maybe penalized at the top. The other thing is, let's say you make, a person makes 67.5 a year, at least they're in the game and, and you would qualify for $2,000 a year every year for adding stuff in. So if they're not as good, but they are still there. And of course the, the car one, I mean, I think you have to make, I don't know, is it, 250 or 300,000, it's a lot, a lot to lose out on the car. Otherwise everybody gets the same, but I agree with you. I mean, I, that, that seems like, I'm not sure how else you'd do it, but it is, it is making it a little harder here. But the other thing is, I think it's easy to finance these things and still come out ahead. So poor people have a harder time doing that. I think at 67.5, you can probably finance and get it done and, and get the 2000 every year for the rebate without problem. So, but anyway, it's a good point. Those are just a few thoughts I'd had about it since then. Yeah, when I figured that out, I, I was looking at the examples. I was like, wow, I, I had expected really good deals and it looks like the rest of the country is getting really good deals, but they're not quite there for us in the same way. Although I do wanna say, and you mentioned them, um, Rewiring America, which is a fabulous resource for all of us. And they have a Rewiring America calculator where you put in your zip code and you put in your household income and it'll right below on, on, on the screen will be all the different things you qualify for. And so it's really very cool, you know? And so that's something I, I think we should all look at and see what kinds of things are available to us at any rate. And there was a pretty big list, it seemed like to me, uh, but so. Um. If I have the emails, we can send that uh, around. Yeah, what I did is I just Googled Rewiring America calculator. <laughs> it came up. And uh, Rewiring America also has, you mentioned it, James. Um, it's just got a thing called Go Electric Now. It's about 30 pages. And, and it's really good. Really good. They're the ones that Saul Griffith started. They're the ones that you'll see there's a section on there. Uh, about their public work that mentions Senator Heinrich very prominently. And so I've always felt a kinship with them. I think they're kind of out ahead in terms of really helping, but a lot's coming down the pike. Um, just to reiterate, I think that if we're going to get, I agree that there are great subsidies for people who are poor. And uh, the problem is the housing stock 
will not support heat pumps as it is. So that's a big problem. Uh, Charlie, did you have another question? Uh, yes. During the uh, convention or, or the solar thing we had over at the convention center, uh, I had talked with people, installers, about getting batteries, backup batteries, because what is worse, uh, the worst part of the having no solar is uh, if you have solar, but you are not even in your consumption. And in other words, uh, there are the expensive times a day and there are the inexpensive times a day. I would love to have a battery to fill in the inexpensive so I don't get dinged for those. And, and the utilities would love it too. But they are way more expensive than the batteries for the uh, cars. And I do not understand that. And they couldn't explain that to me. And uh, But they said, you just wait till May. You watch what happens in May. Do you know anything about that? I don't, no. But I'll look forward to something. <laughs> but clearly batteries, batteries are super duper. And I remember memorably, Elon Musk said when he started the Tesla plants, he says, I'm not really building cars, what I'm doing is building batteries. And that's going to be the future. You know, and he's right. I mean, but there's amazing research being done on batteries, things that can replace lithium and going to solid state rather rather than liquid in the battery, fluid of some kind of the batteries. But I just know that there's a, a ton of of uh, research going in, privately funded research. One is it uses oxidization of iron to, to generate. You, you, would, you would know how, to me, it sounds like magic, but obviously that wouldn't work for a car, but it would work great for a, a, a centralized facility, you know? So again, uh, you know, we're, we're a lot like the beginning of World War II. We're hoping we're going in and we're just gonna hope that some good things start happening to us, right? So to keep this ball rolling. Yeah. We're a little bit over, uh, 10 minutes over. Jane, you had something to ask? You're muted. Real quickly, I'd like to ask Don, in your opinion, what are one or two, three of the most important pieces of legislation that we should be working on advocating for to get passed in the next couple of sessions? state legislation. No, that's a great question. Um, I mean, one of them uh, is just tangential, and that's we've got to do everything in our power to control the methane uh, w w from the gas industry. I mean, that's, what is it, 20 times more powerful than CO2? It doesn't last as long, but it's very worrisome. And the governor, nobody knows exactly, but it seems like she's made great progress on this, but everybody's saying there should be more. There, they don't have enough inspectors, et cetera. So uh, methane is important. And I personally, um, oh, one that I think would be important is we write, we currently have a statute that incentivizes the, the electric company for saving kilowatt hours, okay? So that's why they'll, they'll, you'll see they, they sponsor light bulb programs or they sponsor energy efficient things and stuff. There's a movement in the country, Colorado's done this, to let that them get incentivized for not just saving kilowatt hours, but in fact, uh, saving greenhouse gas emissions. And in some ways, this kind of goes back to a question we had earlier. Um, I think we're going to have a lot of electricity. We're going to have tons of kilowatt hours. It's going to be really, really inexpensive because it's so much cheaper to do it through wind or solar than it ever would be through gas, et cetera. And so I don't think off peak, we don't really need to worry as much about saving electricity. What we definitely do need to do is save greenhouse gases. And so if they can be incentivized for that under existing legislation, that would be great. And so that's something I hope to be working on in the coming session. Um, otherwise, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, they didn't pass state subsidies for EVs, and, and they they've drastically underfund the agencies who are like responsible for drawing up the rules, so they just never get them done, you know? So those kinds of things, but that's kind of inside baseball. I'm not sure which legislation is going to fix that, but 
we have very creative environmental groups in the state. And so we'll see what comes up and we'll kind of keep track of what looks like it could help us. So you seem to think, or I've gotten the opinion today and listening to you that um, the electric companies themselves are going to be taking a lot of responsibility to convert to renewables. I think they're, yes, I do, absolutely. The game is over. See, the way, the way a, a, an investor-owned utility makes its money, and really one of the only ways, is on interest, they're paid for undepreciated assets. So that means the thing that makes them money is to build gas plants or build infrastructure, build transmission lines. And for the life, until that's fully depreciated, they get about 10% every, every year on it. Right. And so ultimately, to some degree, they're kind of agnostic about how much electricity they sell because they really don't make that much money over that. And so that's why for many years they built another gas plant every three years, whether we needed one or not. I mean, it was a very it was really a shameful period of until until Mary Lee Souls and uh, Alan Downs and Phil Schaefer and. Steve Fishman got involved in interventions. That was what was happening generally. Now, the city of Las Cruces, I got to give a shout out to this council and mayor. They've invested a ton of city money in fighting the, these kinds of unwise expenditures and have really, without much notice, saved ratepayers tens of millions of dollars a year. So they're heroes. There'd be, there'd be statues in front of them in front of City Hall. But uh, naturally, I've lost track of the question already. <laughs> Sorry mm -hmm. about that. But what, what was the, the last question you asked, Jane? What, what was the last question you asked just most recently? Well, it, it was that it, it appears oh, okay. that you have yes. faith that so, the electric companies themselves will get on top of generating electricity through renewables. Yeah, and, and they will. They're absolutely going to go that direction. The question is at what cost, right? And so that's uh -huh. the controversy behind the big Evan grid purchase up at PNM. I don't know if you followed that in the newspapers. This enormous international conglomerates kind of tried to take over PNM. And the PRC with Steve Fishman on it turned them down. They didn't trust them, et cetera. And the worry is that they're going to come in and dominate solar, dominate wind, dominate everything, and make it really expensive for us. And New Mexicans have a history in this way, in this. The cattle boom, the timber boom, the mining boom, throughout our history, the atomic boom came in and left us poorer than ever, you know? And so uh, I personally, and, and some people think I'm foolish on this, I personally like uh, and am heartened by the El Paso Electric leadership. They brought a new, new woman in who has really made, it's been night and day in terms of, of our work with them. But there's a lot of money at stake and PNM is 10 times as big. So that's the worry, trying to keep control of the costs and still building in time and at scale. So my own feeling is I'm willing to pay extra. I'm willing to have money leak out around the seams, just like we did in World War II, we mobilized. And everybody got 7% on their, all these companies got 7% of whatever their costs were. A bunch of them cheated like crazy, and it took a long time to catch up on them. A lot of them are never caught. But we're in that same kind of situation now. I mean, when in doubt, uh, I want to get this done, you know. But that's the question. How much is it going to cost? But are the utilities behind this? Yeah. And were they ultimately built to do this kind of thing, bring huge capital to rapid expansion? Yes. If we waited for the state to do it, it would never happen. But will they maximize their profit, you bet, you know. And that's so why mean, we gotta be really robust in our vigilance at the PRC and our interventions and stuff. Right, and this would mean that you wouldn't be especially supportive of the local energy gas bill. Um, I, I, I gotta say that I'm not a huge fan, but I don't know, that's one where everybody gets to pick their own, uh, uh, where they're gonna get their electricity from. I think it makes it hard for the utilities because they need to know how many customers they're going to have to, to build out to the sizes they want to build out. So that makes it difficult for them. I've been a big support. I'm a, I'm a government guy. I'm a big supporter of government. I, I personally am not sure 
that system will guarantee the reliability we want and guarantee that what happened in El Paso and in California during Enron won't happen to us. I mean, a lot of these local mm -hmm. choice people end up paying way more for electricity. So I think many of my friends in the environmental movement think I'm a sap and, and, and mistaken about that and, and we need control. I don't know. I just want to get this done. The utilities know what they're doing. We just got to really, in my view, intervene regularly. So in answer to your question, Jane, that's not one I'm waving the flag for. If we get it, I, 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 we'll probably be okay. But uh, I don't know. For better or worse, I'm kind of casting my lot with the utilities right now. I just okay. look what happens in the legislature. And we put them in charge of our energy future. And then you got one side, oh, let's do this, one side. Do that. El Paso Electric knows what they... You know, the El Paso Electric has a single shareholder, and that's J.P. Morgan. So they can move quick, quickly. And they made that point at the Buena Vista. They said, yeah, this is what happens when we can move quickly. We can roll this stuff out. If we waited for each city to pick, I'm not even confident we would pick the low energy alternative. We might decide, our voters might decide, heck, let's just go with the cheaper option, right? Or something. You know, so I, I'm not as big a fan, and I know I'm at odds with many of my good friends, and I, I could be wrong, absolutely, but I'm kind of a utility guy these days, as long as you keep a close eye on them. <laughs> okay. uh, let's see. Hey, did you have anything else? Steve's got no, no. Can you make it very quick? Yes, sir. Should wrap up. We're way over time. Uh, well, I. Well, I think it, it was worth our time. Um, let yes. me uh, ask you a different question. With all the land we've got here and the, the perfect conditions we've got for solar, why aren't we making uh, solar farms? Why, why aren't we, as someone was saying, that uh, the electricity works better if it's generated locally? We've got more land than any state's got that isn't being used and probably never will be. And we could be filled with uh, solar plants, solar panels. Yeah. I, I don't understand why we're not doing that. Okay, first, I agree that there's a there's enormous amount of land. And if you fly from, you fly from Northern California to here, all you see is empty land. I mean, empty, dry, uncultivated land, you know, and, and so- And sunshine. The sun shining all the time, right? So the first, there's, there's several reasons. One is um, that it's got to be near transmission facilities. Somebody brought that up. So you put it way out in the middle of nowhere, it's hard to get it. But there's plenty that's near transmission facilities. A second is that the utilities weren't into it for a long time. I mean, they dragged their feet and they were the ones, only ones that got to make and sell power, right? That's monopoly they've got. And so they did drag their feet horribly and maybe still doing it, right? And so, and, and, and like home, home installations and stuff, they don't like them because they don't own them, you know? And, and so they have to service them and they don't make any money off it. So that's still a, a problem there. But I think by necessity, we're gonna resolve those prob some of those problems going forward. There's gonna be better alignment. And finally, most of you have heard of community solar right, which is passed by the legislature. And that involves, they started out with like, I don't know, a bunch of bidders, but the utilities pared it down to there aren't that many, but for a starting thing, starting next week, I think they're gonna release the winners in that. And these are, these are people that bid and said, we're gonna provide X amount of solar to the system for this amount of money. And they were all bidding and, showing that they had capacity to move it onto the grid and everything. And 40% of that, by the way, has to go to low income people. And so it's kind of a, it's kind of an effort to crack that open. And El Paso Electric is still kind of in control of it, but they don't make the money these entrepreneurs do. And, and I've been told that by landowners all over, if you had a patch of land, somebody was calling you and saying, can I use it? I want to do a community solar thing. So. Uh -huh. It's robust, and it, Illinois, I'm, when they put out their community solar, they neglected to put a cap on it. And shoot, they they generated bids way over what they produce every year immediately, right? And so it, it just is a lot of consternation. And plus, El Paso Electric has to figure out how to get all that in and out of the grid and the flow and stuff. So, but anyway, I think 
It's going to happen. I agree with you. I personally feel like there's plenty of land to do it and plenty of wind blowing, you know, and so that's not, that's the least of our problems, I think, you know, really. As a matter of fact, utilities, I mentioned that they make their money off undepreciated assets. So what they're doing, which I think is what needs to be done, they're moving their investments away from generation and letting that just be done by, by bidders who do power purchase agreements. And they're moving it all to the grid, all to smart meters, all to transmission and distribution, where they can very beneficially make profits for the next two decades, right? I'm saying more power to them. If we need to build out, build out, let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> given in, in given robust that question, oversight, yeah. yeah. In asking that question, I did not mean to say that what we would do is supply New York City with electricity. But it certainly seems reasonable to me that we could supply Las Cruces with local solar energy. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Buena Vista, that one they just built, six, they claim it would power 60,000 homes. So, you know, put four or five of those and you're there. Uh, so, yeah, I, 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 I think I, I'm super bullish on generation. You know, I, I think there's plenty, you know, I agree. Um, Let's see, uh, since we're talking community solar, I'll mention that uh, 1,700 megawatts were requested. Only 200 megawatts were allowed. So they denied 1,500 megawatts of power of community solar just this year. And the total solar power in New Mexico, actually, according to my charts, was uh, 1,500 or so. In other words, they turned down more community solar than all the existing solar in New Mexico. Now, I'm not sure if those numbers stand up to this new Buena Vista plant, but, uh, and, and the other thing was that New Mexico, on a chart of uh, states with community solar, there are 40, we are 40th, we're at the bottom. So it uh, was a real disappointment to see that that was so small. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. We're just getting started, of course, but yeah, I don't know. I, it definitely got cut back from what it could have been. And this, again, it's because they don't make very much money off of it. They really don't. And and so there's a whole movement, and this is part of what Jane mentioned, the, the, um, uh, the legislation there. There's a movement to essentially force utilities to move to being transmission generation operations. And uh, former Chancellor Avisu, I remember seeing him say, that's, that's where we're going eventually. And so just let somebody contract out for the generation. It's very inexpensive, et cetera. I think the worry that remains is reliability. I mean, is the city of Las Cruces going to guarantee that this company we bought from is going to not drop out when the temperature drops or whatever? I don't know. You know, and, and El Paso Electric, I mean, their, their reliability is... They consider you, they've broken their reliability goal and pledge if they have one system-wise outage in 10 years, right? And so that, that's their way into reliability. And our, and our power doesn't go off very much, really. And that's very important to people, you know? But it only has to happen a few times and everybody's calling for somebody's head, you know? So I think that's still there, but it, it's, a big, it's a big muddle. And, we're going to have a lot here, a lot of smart people talking about it over the next year, and what they think is going to happen. You know, well, we could continue discussing this. It is 3 30, so we've run way over our time. Uh, I would like to thank Don Kurtz for having come and put up with all of our questions. Thank you very and much, all of the participants. Yeah, great questions. I, one thing I just, I, I be as you're contracting now to get something rehab done in your house, like a heat pump put in or heat pump water heater, just be thoughtful, be careful, make sure it doesn't sound too expensive because it could be. And you know, it's hard to even get three estimates now because there's not enough companies really robustly acting. But I think we all need to keep talking to each other, find out who's doing good work. Absolutely, Oregon Mountain on the solar. There's a, a group called Solar Smart Living that I think very highly of on, on um, on uh, heat pumps and stuff that's good. And this meeting inspires me to call the ring guy tomorrow and ask him, you know, if he ever has his, 
is whatever they call them, diamond installers, if that group is fleshed out and if people call Reem, they can find them, you know, I don't know. I mean, it, they're, they're pumping up fast. By the way, I'll keep, I keep talking. That's why we go to 3.30, but they're, both Reem and Mitsubishi are putting in enormous plants to, to do heat pump water heaters and heat pumps. Everybody is, every company is doing it. And it's, it's just, it's happening every, you know, and Biden, I don't know if we remember this, but he invoked the War Powers Act to facilitate the building of heat pumps and heat, heat pump technologies way before uh, the IRA passed. So I don't know, he was betting on the come for sure. And I mean, I gotta say I was astounded when it passed, but it's a game changer. It's gonna move things along. So we gotta strap on, you know, this is a very exciting time to be alive. It's happening right in front of our eyes and, and with our participation, it's amazing. Don, if you do talk to the Reem guy, can yeah. you tell him about our, our unique housing here, just cinder block houses with four inches of insulation in the ceiling? Because my sense is these places were built to burn a lot of gas in the winter and then run a swamp cooler in the summer. And our air quality won't really let you run a swamp cooler all the time now. And gas costs a lot more and we don't want to do that. And what I don't want to see is a lot of people in Las Cruces try to stick in a heat pump on a house that a heat pump can't run. So if they have any insight on that, I think it's a, I'd be glad to hear it. Well, the Rim guy won't know that because he'll be talking about water heaters. So first off, so the water heater, I think is going to work for you. Uh, generally speaking, as long as you're thoughtful where you place it. On the other, that's, that's a really... Really good point. The city of Las Cruces is really, in my view, taking the lead on rehabs, especially for low-income people. And um, just some, just, if you're ever interested, uh, you might consider inviting the Reem guy in to talk with us. He he do what I'm doing today. And one of the Mis Mitsubishi people, they're great. I mean, they're really knowledgeable, and you'd have the same kind of discussion with somebody who actually knows about you know the the, tech, the technical end of this, which I don't always know. But uh, but anyway, that's a thought, and I'd be happy to put you in touch with people to come in and do that kind of talk with you if you'd like. I'd like to thank James and his committee for the good work they're doing. I think it's once again where Unitarians can lead and help the community as we're helping ourselves. Thanks, James. Thank you, James. Thanks to the committee. That's... Uh standing behind me and working with me and doing everything that I'm messing up, fixing it. So thanks a lot. I, there's, a, there's a guy that just showed up on my screen here, Alan Downs. Alan, can you hear us there? Can you wave? Alan's a genius in all this stuff. So he's a good guy to uh, keep track of too on this. So, okay, anyway. All right, I would like to uh, again, thank everybody for showing up and uh, let you know that we do not have regularly scheduled roundtables yet. We're, we're at, <laughs> at experimenting to see what works. This one definitely worked. So that means something for what we're going to do in the future. And we will sit down and talk about it. Thanks very much. And that ends this one. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Don.